Well, we are, we're entering session 15, in which we're going to explore chapter 45. There's some overlap from last week's uh, study, but there's some issues here too important. I didn't want to, uh, to, to uh, crowd it with other distractions. And it does bring up an issue that's very controversial called the gap theory, and we'll be getting into that. And so, again, though, as you probably have noticed, there's a huge change in uh, style as well as themes since we crossed the border into Chapter 40 and beyond. And, of course, we are leaning very heavily on the proprietary translation of the Great Scroll of Isaiah by Dr. Peter Flint himself, and uh, that uh, is, is the primary document behind the International Standard Version Bible. And so our style here has been to take a look at the ISV rendering and then we'll, and re recognizing that the ISV uses the D Dead Sea Scrolls as their primary reference, relegating the Masoretic and the Septuagint texts uh, as just variants. A very dramatic difference and it makes it a very, very provocative translation. And so uh, we will confine most of our comments, though, on the as we look at the King James rendering, because that's probably more familiar to most of us. But the design of this whole second unit from chapter 40 to the end is quite different. There are three major points to it. The purpose of peace from chapters 40 to 48. The prince of peace will be the focus of 49 to 57. And then the rest of the book will be the program of peace. The purpose, the prince, and the program of peace. Three major sections. The prince of peace is bracketed by verse 48, 22, and 57, 21, there is no peace, saith Yorivave, uh, to the wicked. But the other observation I want to just alert you, alert you to in advance is the, high, the Holy of Holies of the Old Testament, in the minds of many, is chapter 53. And the Holy of Holies, as we call it, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, it's a very, it's a, we're going to really have a focus there. It's interesting that it happens to be in the exact center of of the second unit. There's 13 chapters leading up to it, and there's 13 chapters that follow it. But meanwhile, we'll move on here. Last, last session, we were in chapter 44, and it closed with a couple of verses that really belong into tonight's study. Uh, <clears throat> the end of Isaiah 44, starting at verse 27, he says, That saith to the deep, Be dry, and I will dry up thy rivers. That saith of Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure. Even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. An incredible couple of verses there that introduce this peculiar guy by the name of Cyrus. In fact, that first verse is really the very method that Cyrus uses to conquer Babylon. There was no battle, they took it over. But by drying up the, the Euphrates River and slipping in under the gates. In fact, some of the residents there didn't know they'd been taken over for three days. It's a very, very subtle, very important historical event for a lot of reasons. It's going to impact our future, too, and I'll get to that. But uh, in verse 28, it mentions Cyrus by name. He was hinted at earlier, you may recall. And uh, so this isn't the first time Josiah had his name mentioned uh, 300 years before his birth. And, of course, Daniel 11, uh, 300 years before its events. But it says, it says of Cyrus, God, this is God speaking through Isaiah, that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. What a strange thing for the God of the universe to, to put, what kind of a label he put that on Cyrus. And shall perform all my pleasure. Boy, that's quite a statement. Even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built. Now what makes this prophecy so provocative that's a prophecy that gets fulfilled at the end of the Babylonian captivity, which hasn't happened yet. In fact, that captivity went on for 70 years. And even Babylon's rise to power hasn't happened yet. It will happen, and in in, it'll start to show up in the rise of Hezekiah, of course. Even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. And so it's even predicting the destruction of the the. the, the in, in, implicit destruction of the, the uh, temple, which happens, of course, in the Babylonian attack. So it's a very strange prophecy because it repairs something that hasn't been damaged yet, so to speak. And so, uh, now Cyrus the Great is quite a guy. He's more than just a great man that founded an empire, from the Aegean Sea, by the way, all the way to the Indus River. He is also seen by many observers as the epitome of a great leader. He's quite a model to follow. 
considered very brave, very daring, tolerant, very magnanimous. He conquered most of his conquests without a battle and uh, through skill and uh, phenomenal, actually. In fact, in 1971, Iran celebrated the 2500th anniversary of his monarchy, by the way, but move on here. Cyrus II, technically, but everybody knows him as Cyrus the Great. And he, was the, he, he founded the uh, Achaemenid uh, Arab, uh, Empire. In biblical terms, we usually call it the Medo-Persian Empire because it really was a union of two ethnic groups. And uh, his father was Cambyses I, king of Anshan, which is Elam. And uh, his mother was Mandane, the daughter of Astekiagis, the king of Media. And uh, so in 550 BC, he attacks his father-in-law, the, the corrupt Astyagis, and he captured Ekbadana, the capital, without a battle, which becomes his pattern later on the other things he does. And he welded the Medes and the Persians. We know the Medes today as the Kurds, very much in the news, because there's Kurds are, are split among three other countries. In Turkey, Iraq, and Iran have Kurdish segments, and it's, it's sort of an ethnic group without a country. But uh, we know them from the biblical references of the Medes. Medes and the Persians do a unified uh, 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 empire. That empire survives for 200 years. And uh, a very, very powerful, powerful entity. And it stood off the Roman Empire for centuries. So, Now, on October 12th of 539 B.C., the Persians conquer Babylon. This turns out to be a big deal in Jewish history, of course, because they by then had been conquered by Babylon, taken into cap uh, captivity. But on October 12th of 539, Cyrus's general, who actually ran the troops, captures battle, uh, 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 Babylon. And um, the, per the way they did that, it's important for us to understand, the Persians diverted the river Euphrates into a canal upriver so that the water level would drop to the height of the middle of a man's thigh, as they say. Uh, Herodotus records all that. Uh, which thus rendered the flood useless and enabled the invaders to march through the riverbed to enter at night. So they just took it over. I mention this because many people, when they read history superficially, feel that Babylon was conquered by the Persians. They assume it was destroyed. No, it wasn't destroyed. It becomes a secondary capital for the Persian Empire. Several centuries later, when Alexander the Great conquers Babylon, he too makes it his capital. The reason this is so important for you and I, let me comment on this a little bit, because it has an impact for us in the future. Babylon fell to the Persians here. They fell to the Greeks under Alexander the Great. But they gradually atrophy. When Alexander dies and his generals divide up the empire, the other cities are built that take most of the caravan trade. So Babylon tends to drift into irrelevancy. As late as 75 A.D., the merchants are still trying to make a go of it. Why am I making this, bi this big effort? Because as you study the issue of Babylon, it's a very important topic for you to get very uh, uh, well briefed on. In Isaiah 13 and 14, and in Jeremiah 50 and 51, there's great details on the final, at the end time, a destruction of Babylon. And they both detail that destruction uh, with great specification. In fact, both of them, both Isaiah and Jeremiah, use the expression that it'll be destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah. What they mean by that, it was done in one hour, and once it was done, it was permanent, never again to rise up. Sodom and Gomorrah never has shown up, and it's gone forever for good. Babylon will have the same destiny. In fact, they both mention that even the building materials will never be reused. Now, the reason I mention all of that, there's a lot of confusion among academics about Babylon's history and their future. But Babylon has never suffered the destruction that the Bible details in both Isaiah and Jeremiah. Now, what does that mean? If you dismiss the Bible, it's not a problem. But if you take the Bible seriously, as we obviously do, that tells us that Babylon is destined to be destroyed as both Jeremiah and Isaiah detail, in great detail. In fact, even Revelation has some allusions, but that gets a little more complicated. But the real point I'm making here is, is Saddam Hussein undertook the reconstruction of Babylon. He, had, he spent millions on getting the best archaeologists to certify the 
the foundations and so forth, and he partially has rebuilt the city of Babylon as a tourist attraction or whatever. It's now under guard by the Marines, but you, you, if you have a pull, you can go there and take a tour. We have a film tour that we show when we study the Babylon thing. The point is, though, if we understand the Bible correctly, Babylon, and I'm not talking about a symbolic thing, I'm talking about a literal city on the banks of the Euphrates is destined to rise again into prominence on the world scene, if for no other reason than to sustain the judgment that God has in store for them. Now the reason that's so important is right now today there's no, it's, it's not like we're trying to twist the Bible to fit current events. Quite the contrary. You can't find any evidence that Babylon's going to be mount anything other than a, you know, an archaeological uh, tourist thing. But if we understand the Bible correctly, somewhere along the way, it could be next month, it could be next year, it might be several years away, but somewhere along the way the geopolitical horizon on the planet Earth is going to shift in some way as to, so as to make Babylon reemerge as some kind of primary uh, power center. Now when that starts to happen, I want you to remember you heard it here first, <laughs> okay? But suddenly a lot of people that we've been saying this for some years now are going to suddenly wake up and realize that that's what the Bible has predicted all along and that will also give rise. See, that, that this all sort of had its echo back in uh, the 40s. I can remember as a kid that uh, during the war years, many of the uh, people thought that Hitler was the Antichrist. And there was a lot of that kind of talk and so forth. But there were a couple of guys on the radio, a guy by the name of Harry Ironside and M.R.D. Hahn. They were on the radio and they pointed out that Hitler could not be the Antichrist because Israel is not in the land. It was clear that they, that guy rises to power when Israel is in the land. And of course, in the 40s, uh, there was a big debate among Bible scholars that whether Israel would ever reemerge in history. Most of them thought no, because they have this replacement theology nonsense that was going around. But on May 14th of 1948, that debate should have ended. Because David Ben-Gurion, using Ezekiel as his authority, declared the new Jewish homeland, Israel. And so the very thing that these guys on the radio were predicting happened. And uh, that, 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 changed the, that changed the landscape, if you will. Well, we've got another thing like, another potential like that. Somewhere along the way, there's going to be a move. Uh, some people suspect that maybe the UN will move there, and there's some loose talk like that. Nothing serious so far. But somewhere along the way, something's going to happen to make Babylon relevant in the world scene. And when it does, that's going to be a huge wake-up call to those that know their Bible. And so that's why, that's why this issue, to understand the fall of Babylon by under Cyrus, was not a battle. He just took it over. That's a very key point. In fact, he brags about that in the cylinder of Cyrus that we have on display here, and a, a replica of it. Now what's interesting... As I say, uh, uh, his general took, uh, uh, captured Babylon. Ten days later, he, Cyrus himself comes to make his grand entrance. And it's really quite interesting because uh, Josephus records what happened when he made his entrance. Because as he makes his entrance, he's greeted by Daniel. And Daniel has a copy, this ancient scroll of Isaiah, and he reads to Cyrus a letter that God wrote to him, Cyrus, calling him by name that was written 150 years earlier. And Cyrus isn't skeptical, he's profoundly impressed and, it, and acts upon it. That's what he himself records in a cylinder that's on display in the London Museum, and we have a replica here if you want to take a look at it. So he, this ancient scroll addresses him by name, we're going to take a look at that letter, but all of this is recorded in Josephus in Antiquities, 11th chapter, 11th volume, I mean. Isaiah had died 150 years before Cyrus was born, so this, is, this really shook Cyrus up. What was his response to this? He obviously was very impressed. Wouldn't you be? If you, you're a big conqueror, you come, you take over, and you discover that one of their ancient prophets has written you a letter where God says, I'm calling you by name so that you'll know that I'm the God of Israel. And so what does he do? He frees the, he frees the captives. He lets the Jews that are slave, have been slaved there for seven years go home. In fact, he gives them donations to build their temple. He gives them financial incentives to go home and, and, and pursue the God that they, they worship. And uh, only 50, less than 50,000 take advantage of that, by the way, which is another interesting comment. But uh, so the, uh, 
And they go, but they go back to Jerusalem under Zerubbabel. And, and that leads to the book of Ezra and Nehemiah in your Bible. So, and so uh, uh, you can look that up. Your references are there in the notes. But in the 19th century, a guy by the name of Rassam found the, the, the cylinder, and it's presently in the London Museum, and we have a good friend gave us a, a replica of it. You can take a look at it here if you like later. And it'll be on display here in the executive briefing room in a display case outside later. And basically it's where Cyrus brags that he captured Babylon without a battle, and they relieve, he relieves him to go home, in effect. And so th this is recorded in Ezra chapter 1, 2. In Ezra chapter 1, the, uh, verse 2 and 3, it says, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, quote, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel, paren, he is the God which is in Jerusalem. Interesting comment. Very interesting comment by Cyrus. Okay, so that's the background we hit last time. Let's just jump into chapter 45, starting at verse 1, and we'll start, as is our style, we'll take a look at how the ISV renders it. It has a flow that's quite comfortable, by the way. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him, and I strip kings of their armor. I open doors before him and gates that cannot keep closed. I myself will go before you, and he will make the mountains level. I'll shatter bronze doors and cut through iron bars. I'll give you concealed treasures and riches hidden in secret places, so that you'll know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by name. It goes on. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, and Israel, my chosen, I've called you, and he has established you with a name, although you have not acknowledged me. I am the Lord, and there is no other besides me. There are no gods. I'm strengthening you, although you have not acknowledged me, so that from the sun's rising to the west, people may know that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. So that's the ISV. It flows pretty well. The King James is, is, is not materially different, but we'll take a look at it. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings. Now see, this is one place that the King James picks up something the ISV didn't tag in. It says, I will loose the loins of kings. Now if you may recall, last time we went through Daniel 5, where Belshazzar is confronted, he's throwing this big party, he's confronted with a handwriting on the wall, and, and, and everybody's terrified because they see this hand writing this coded message on the wall, and it says that his knees smote one against the other, and his loins were loosed. And of course, when you see that in the King James, it may not register what's happening here, but he obviously, what's interesting is, not only was it a public embarrassment for the king to have that happen, it was a fulfillment of prophecy. Because long before that, in this letter that God wrote to Cyrus, it mentions that, and I will loose the loins of kings. That's not the kind of expression you'd normally include in some kind of summary. That's a very, very embarrassing, but apparently very public uh, item, because it was, it's in Daniel chapter 5 as an event that happened there, and here we discover it's prophesied that that's exactly what would happen. And to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. And that all has to do with the way they were able to slip in and capture Babylon. And that gets into a whole discussion of the double walls and all that. They had chariot races six abreast around the wall. It was a non-trivial defense. It was considered impregnable, which it obviously wasn't. But then God continues here, I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the uh, bars of iron. Now it says here, uh, it's, uh, it says that uh, he subdued nations before him. By the way, those nations were, make a guess how many? Would you believe 46? The Medes, the Babylonians, the Lydians, the Carians, the Cancanians, the Lycians, the Bactrians, the Sake, the Parthians, the Hyrcanians, the Chorasmanians, uh, the Sogdians, and a bunch of others I can't pronounce properly. Uh, but the point is, it, 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 they literally, the, the, they've... Uh, listed 46 
uh, countries that he took over and uh, so forth. And, uh, and the gates not shut, is the, that was the key to their victory without having a battle. And the two leaf gates were the double gates of Babylon and so forth. So that's all recorded in this letter to Cyrus, written 150 years before he was born. And he's also, another thing that I want to highlight here, there's a strange term in the Bible used of a Gentile king. He's called his anointed. That's nowhere used of anything, but it's not used of a Gentile. It's the only place it is. And many scholars sort of see Cyrus in a certain sense as a type of the, of the coming prince, our coming prince, the Lord Jesus. I'll loose the lords of kings. I, get, I think I've beat that one to death. We'll move on. I will give thee the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. Get this next verse. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. Boy, he, the Lord really underscores that. He makes it quite clear. This isn't a coincidence. It isn't that it, having written to somebody who also his name is... No, he's, it's specifically uh, uh, addressed to this person. And that's what grabs him when he sees that, of course. He's obviously duly impressed. And so, uh, and he, of course, responds to that. God continues, I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. Wow. Okay. So the, the ISV now parses this a little differently. Going on from verse 7 on, it says, God continues about talking about it. This is a very interesting passage because here again, God is talking about himself. He doesn't do that very often. I form the light and create darkness. I make goodness and create disaster. I am the Lord who does all these things. Shout, you skies above and you clouds, and let righteousness stream down. I am the one who says to the earth, let salvation blossom and let righteousness uh, sprout forth. Woe to the one who quarrels with his makers and a mere potsherd with the potsherds of the earth. Woe to the one who says to the one forming him, what are you making? And your work has no human hands? Oh, sarcasm in there, really. Woe to the one who says to his father, What are you begetting? Or to a woman, To what are you giving birth? This is what the Lord says, the creator of the signs. Question me about my children, or give me orders about the work of my hands. I myself have made the earth and personally created humankind upon it. Mine own hands stretched out the skies. I marshaled all their starry hosts. Wow. Okay. Well, the King James uh, picks up a couple of things here. He, let's, let's see the same passage in, in, in that handling. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. Now, that's a phrase that bothers a lot of people. That's the way it's translated by the King James translators. But the, that word ra really can mean adversity or calamity. It never means sin. God didn't create sin, but he, of course, assures the consequences of sin. And those backup notes are the, uh, verses are in your notes. I, the Lord, do all these things. Drop down ye heavens from above and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open and let them bring forth salvation. Let the righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. This is one of the places even the King James flows every bit as good as the ISV, I think, here. Woe to him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioned it, What makest thou? Or thy work? He hath no hands. Woe to him that saith unto his father, What begest thou? Or to the woman, what hast thou brought forth? And uh, we're not supposed to question our maker, are we? Very interesting issue here. Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and his maker, Ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands. Command ye me. I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens, and all their host have I commanded. Now, this stretching out the heavens, it's like a curtain. That's a very strange phrase, isn't it? I've stretched out the heavens. That phrase is not just a figure of speech. Stretching the heavens, that's de dealing with the fabric of space. You and I tend to jump to the conclusion that space is empty. It's empty space. That's our misunderstanding. This is more than a metaphor. 
The scripture says, who alone stretches out the heavens in Job, stretching out the heaven like a tent curtain, Psalm 104, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in, in Isaiah 40. He has stretched out the heavens in Jeremiah 10, the Lord who stretches out the heavens in Zechariah 12. I could go on here with a lot more of these. The point being, the scripture, the Lord, continually speaks of stretching space. Now, space, you see, we now know, by the way, if you're really sophisticated in physics, is not an empty vacuum. It can be torn, according to Isaiah 64. It can be worn out like a garment, according to Psalm 102. It can be shaken, according to Hebrews, Haggai, and Isaiah. It can be burnt up, Peter warns us in 2 Peter 3. It can be rolled up like a mantle in Hebrews 1, or like a scroll in Isaiah 34. Split apart like a scroll in the book of Revelation, strangely enough. In fact, uh, let's take a look at that. As the stars of heaven fell to the earth, even as a fig tree catches her untimely figs in Revelation there, when she is shaken of a mighty wind, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. You know, there's a lesson here. Many people see this, well, that's just poetic language describing a vision or something like that. I don't believe that for a minute. I believe that every detail there is designed deliberately to communicate something to us. And so, let's take a look at this a little bit. Departed as a scroll. For something to be rolled up, there must be some dimension in which it must be thin in order to be rolled. And it also needs a dimension towards which it can be bent. If you're going to roll something up, that means it's not only thin, but it also is another. In other words, that's telling you that there's more dimensions to space than the three we know about. Interestingly enough. There is a direction that it can be bent toward, and there must be additional spatial dimensions. And the current estimate by the experts in this area is 10, that we live in a 10-dimensional universe. Four of those dimensions we can directly perceive, length, width, and height, the three dimensions that make up Euclidean geometry we're taught in school, and time is a fourth dimension. But it's still only four. But we know from a number of indications that there's actually six more that we can't get at. A 10-dimensional universe, if you read the string theorists and so forth, you've, they're all into this thing. There is a, and that's what the scripture also suspects. Nachmanides, an ancient Hebrew sage, con concluded that the, the universe has 10 dimensions from his study of Genesis, the Hebrew of Genesis, uh, the, the book of Genesis. And uh, yet he knows that only four are knowable, six are not knowable. And we suspect that when the, Adam fell and God curses the creation, that it fractured. It was, it was fractured. The four dimensions that we experience obviously are available to us, and we call that the physical, the physical universe. There are six beyond our reach, in a sense, that we can call the spiritual universe. A more common term is consider it the metacosm. The microcosm are things smaller than man. The macrocosm is things larger than man, but both are finite and digital. That's a major discovery in science, and that's a whole other discussion and we'll leave for another day. But uh, the area that we know that the physical universe that we're in is a subset of a larger reality. Scientific American, June of 2005, had an article on that. And uh, because the constants of physics are changing, that implies the, phys the, the uh, physical reality we think we feel is a subset of a larger reality. It's set in a larger context, which, for lack of another term, they call the metacosm. So we'll move on here. Is this possibly the effects of the fall? That's a speculation on our part, but there's a number of us that suspect that entropy, which in the, uh, Paul in his epistle of Romans called the bond, the creation is subject to the bondage of decay. That sounds to us like uh, uh, the entropy laws that are much studied. And that may be, that's when they started, was that, uh, uh, under the curse of, uh, of God. Was the universe then fractured to this four versus six breakdown? That's a speculation. And uh, is, that's when we had a separation of what we, can, what we experience as the physical universe versus the total picture, which would include the spiritual universe. You can't prove to me that Adam and Eve lived in only three dimensions prior to their fall. And that's something we just jumped to conclusions. You, know, you see these funny little coloring books and stuff, but that's a naive. And by the way, you also need to understand when you read your Bible that redemption is not just man. Both Isaiah and uh, 
Revelation speaks of a new heavens and a new earth. Heaven, not only the earth, but heaven is going to be restored or replaced, if you will. Okay, let's take the next segment here. In the ISV it says, I have roused him in righteousness and I'll make all his pathways smooth. It is he who will build my city and set my exiles free, but not for a price nor reward, says the Lord of the heavenly armies. This is what the Lord says, the wealth of Egypt, the merchandise of Ethiopia, those Sabians, men of great heights, they'll come over to you and will be yours. They'll trudge behind you, coming over in chains. They'll bow down to you. They'll plead with you. Surely God is in you, and there is no other God at all. This is Isaiah prophesying here. The King James says pretty much the same thing. He says, I have raised him up in righteousness. I will direct his ways. He will build my city. He will, go, he will let go my captives, not for price or reward, saith the Lord of hosts. That's enigmatic, but that's exactly it. <laughs> he did that because he was impressed with the letter that God had written to him. Thus saith the Lord, the labor of Egypt and the merchants of Ethiopia and the Sabians. Sabians is the southwest of Arabia, by the way, but anyway. Um, Men of stature shall come over to thee, and they shall be thine. They shall come after thee. In chains they shall come over, and they shall fall down unto thee. They shall make supplication unto thee, saying, Surely God is in thee, and there is none else. There is no God. So let's take the next segment. We're, get, we're heading to another interesting challenge forthcoming here. Uh, verse 15 in the ISV is, Truly you are God who, who hides himself, O God of Israel, the Savior. All of them will be put to shame, indeed disgraced. The makers of idols will go off in disgrace together, but Israel will be saved by the Lord with everlasting salvation. You won't be put to shame or disgraced ever again. We're going to hear a lot about idols in the next chapter. That's going to be an emerging theme here, but let's go to, on to verse 18 here. For this is what the Lord says who created the heavens. He is God. And the one who formed the earth and made it, he is the one who established it. He didn't create it for chaos, but formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I didn't speak in secret from somewhere in the land of darkness. I didn't say to Jacob's descendants, seek me in chaos. I, the Lord, speak truth, declaring what is right. This is the ISV, and I'm impressed with it in general. This is one place where they miss something that the the IS, that the King James really nailed. So we'll come back to that here in a minute. Gather together and come, draw near and enter you, your fugitives from the nations. Those who carry around their wooden idols know nothing, nor do those who keep praying to a God that cannot save. Explain and present a case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who announced this long ago? Who declared it from the distant past? Was it not I, the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and Savior, and there is none besides me. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. Notice, by the way, some, God does something here, and he does it frequently in the book of Isaiah. He points to his ability to write history before it happens as an authentication of who he is. Not to give you a divination, the purpose of prophecy isn't to tell you what the future is. The purpose of prophecy is to authenticate him when it happens. So it's very precise, but its purpose isn't to teach you the future. The purpose is for you to, to, to magnify his name when things happen. But the precision is astonishing, and God frequently makes reference to that. You know, who announced this long ago? Who declared it from this mess? Was it not I, the Lord? So he's pointing out that's a gift that only God has. The angels don't have that. He's outside. Eternity is not having lots of time. It's being outside the dimensionality of time altogether. He alone can see the end from the beginning. And it's an a, a attribute of his that he leans on to prove that his message is really from him and not a contrivance or a fraud. Very fundamental issue there. Well, let's look at the King James here because there's something else we're going to encounter here. The King James says, um, Verily thou art a God that hideth thyself, O God, Israel, God of Israel, the Savior. They shall be ashamed and also confounded, all of them. They shall go to confusion together that are makers of idols. But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. Ye shall not be ashamed or confounded world without end. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens. Get this, pay attention here. God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. Key phrase coming up. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. 
I have not spoken in secret in the dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. There's a phrase here that I'm going to table for the moment to finish some other thoughts. And then we're going to take a look at the strange contradiction that this seems to introduce. It says, he created it not in vain. Just remember that we'll come back to that. There's a, there's a speculative possibility that we're going to explore. It's very controversial. Let's finish this passage, though. Assemble yourselves and come, draw you near together, ye that are escaped to the nations. They have no knowledge that set up the wood in a graven image and pray to a God that cannot save. It's amazing how many people pray to a God that cannot save. Muhammad can't save anybody. Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. By the way, did you notice there's two there? A just God and a Savior. I think that's interesting. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. And then the ISV continues just to fin finish. The, we'll finish the chapter and come back to some other issues. Verse 23, by myself I have sworn from my mouth has gone out integrity, a promise that won't be revoked. To me every knee will bow and every tongue will swear. Sounds like the, Paul's epistle to the Philippians, doesn't it? And one will say of me, only in the Lord are victories and might. All who raged against him will come to him and will be put to shame. In the Lord, all the descendants of Israel will triumph and make their boast. Well, in the King James, I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out from my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. And that sounds like Philippians 2.10 for those of you that, what's called the kenosis, that's another, anyway. Surely shall one say in the Lord, have I righteousness and strength, even to him shall men come, and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. Okay. In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. Okay. So we've done faithfulness to the passage. I want to double back on an issue that comes out of the text, which is widely known as the gap theory. There are people that don't believe in it, don't like it. There are also people that think they know it and they apply it to the wrong things. So it's a very touchy area. We're going to explore a very controversial speculation. I want you to be aware of it. I don't want to oversell it because it is controversial, but I want you to be just aware of it and understand what it says. In back there in verse 18, God says that he got himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it not in vain. See, the reason that catches our eye, if you're a diligent student, is because of the second verse in Genesis. Here it says he created it not in vain. Okay. Let's go back to the, where the Bible starts in Genesis chapter 1, starting at verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Period. No argument. Big deal. Great. But then the next verse says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. That was the first quote of God in the Bible. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were day one. Okay, it's the second verse that creates all the discussion. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. Let's take a little more closer look at this, okay? The word order here in the Hebrew is rather strange. It implies that the verse is a pluperfect form. The earth not was was can just mean existence. No, it's a transitive verb requiring action. In Genesis 19, when Lot's wife became a pillar of salt, the word became, same word, used the same way. The earth became without form and void. Okay, big deal. And there's about 20 examples of that, by the way, in this chapter, but we'll get on here. Okay, the earth became without form and void. Now the word for, form and void is tohu vubohu. The very word that in Isaiah, verse 45, verse 18, I, I did not create it in vain or in void, you see. So it seems like those two verses contradict each other. God didn't create it that way, 
But in verse 2, it doesn't say he did. It says it became that way. Well, how, it also implies some time between verse 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. Period. Good. Time passes. And the earth became without form or void is the thought. Okay? So the word was there is a haya, which means had become in the blue form. Um, the uh, without form and void, uh, without form is tohu, without form or confused, and void is uh, 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 bohu, tohu vabohu is, is the phrase, uh, empty or waste. And uh, now what's interesting here, the word and there, used the way it's used, is actually an adversative conjunction. It should be translated but, not and, but the earth became. And uh, that, when you, when you get the top Jewish experts three centuries before Christ's birth who translated the Hebrew scriptures into Greek, those experts translated that way. But the earth became, had become, but the earth had become. You with me? So this isn't a contrived analysis. That's what the experts concluded back then. And uh, it's, adverse the, the, it's adversative. Let me rephrase it the way it, the people would argue it should be translated. But the earth became without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And so uh, the, uh, the thing that, uh, and incidentally, this tohu vubohu, for these words are used in Isaiah 34 and, I, and, and uh, several places, including Jeremiah 4. I'm going to show you a strange passage See, the real issue that lurks behind all of this is a question, when did Satan fall? When you read your Bible, you get to chapter 3, he shows up to lead Adam and Eve into trouble. There's no background. You have to infer that background from other passages. Well, the question is, we know that he led a rebellion. It's all described in Revelation 12 and elsewhere. He led a rebellion. But when did he fall? And the suggestion that comes out of this text is that he, see, he fell sometime prior to Genesis 3, but after Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, obviously, because he was, he was a created thing. Somehow, between Genesis 1, verse 2, there was a rebellion and a judgment, and that's when he fell. And it would all occur in this apparent interval between the first two verses. And that's what makes this thing so provocative, but obviously very, very controversial. And so, the, and darkness is on the face of the deep, and that word in the Hebrew is an unnatural darkness, of course, and, uh, and the face of the deep, and that the home is the, not just deep in the sense of deep water, it's the domain, if you will, the abusos, it's the home of the demons and evil spirits. So there's a, there's a, a dark casting on this whole passage anyway, by the way. And uh, the, the whole idea of the, uh, these words, confusion and emptiness, are used elsewhere in Isaiah, meaning just those things. And, but the one that really triggered all this is that in verse 18 of Isaiah 45, that he created it not in vain. When Genesis verse 1 verse 2 says it became vain, which implies there's something, there's something hinted at and not detailed. When you get to Jeremiah, there's a passage there. No one's quite sure what it means. Jeremiah talks about, he says, I beheld the earth and lo, it was without form and void. That catches our phrase right there, that, that same word. It was, I, I beheld the earth, and it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. And again, we've got the same two words, tohu bohu, right there, the without form and empty and waste and so on. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. And I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness. And all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. It describes a judgment, a very serious judgment. Some people speculate that may be a judgment associated with the fall of Satan and it may have occurred before the second verse of Genesis 1. That's a speculation. And this, this uh, tohu bohu phrase appears elsewhere, but always as a result of a judgment is the point they make. And that may be what happened. Maybe it was a judgment of Lucifer between in, in, in verse 2. And so in no way does this have anything with, with dinosaurs and fossils. They all, the dinosaurs died, which means they were after Adam. They're all after all this. But this gap theory that I've just sort of touched on here, 
was originally suggested by a Scotsman, Thomas Chalmers, in 1814. It's supported, by the way, in writings by G.H. Pember, which is very worth reading. He's quite a writer. One of my favorite commentators on the Bible all my life has been Donald Gray Barnhouse. And he wrote a very key book called The Invisible War, which is built on this whole issue, by the way. So here's a very uh, profound scholar, evangelical, um, and, uh, and he, he, he's very much committed to this. G. Campbell Morgan and A. Constance. These are all people that have embraced the so-called gap theory. I mention that because most commentators today uh, put it on the shelf. They don't, they don't take it. In fact, and that's why the ISV doesn't touch on it either because the principles there uh, didn't want to <laughs> inflame that whole discussion again. It is highly speculative, very controversial, but it does seem to link to other passages. That's why I, I think it's very provocative, even though many people misapply it. And uh, see, the angels were well created. Well, see, the earth is aware. The earth is in place in chapter in verse one. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. The angels were created before that, because they cheered when God created the earth. The sun and all that comes in day four. Not, in, it's already there in day one. See, so many, many people miss that. And so, for further study, if you want to get into this, we do have uh, some briefing packages beyond time and space. Genesis and some others. Uh, G. H. Pember is a very worth his, his one of his greatest books is Earth's Earliest Ages, back in 1887. It's very readable, available, very widely available. Donald Gray Barnhouse's book The Invisible War is one of my favorites. In fact, his commentary on Revel I have probably five or six feet of books on Revelation alone. My favorite of the bunch though is Donald Gray Barnhouse's study of Revelation. By the way, good, he's a real good guy. But there's some basic issues here. Is there a gap between verse 1 and 2? Well, that's the debate. How old is the universe? Some people, the scientists try to tell us it's 15 billion years old. Our problem is God tells us in, the, uh, in, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, that he did it in six days, and he does it in a context he expects us to understand those as days. And so uh, there's a big debate there. Both may be true, by the way. It may be very young. It may also look like uh, 16 years because the speed of light changes and there's a whole study that's a whole nother discussion sometime. So, so is it less than 10,000 years old or is it more than 15 billion? And when were the angels created? Well before the earth is the key point and that's, that's when Satan was created. Well when did Satan fall? That's the debate. That's the debate. And uh, people say you don't have any proof that it was then. That's true. Can you give me an alternative? When might he have fallen? And you think that through, you've got some interesting problems that emerge. I'll leave that with you then. And I, God short of challenges Job on these topics. He says, Where was thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath the measures of it thereof, and who knowest? Or who stretched hit the line upon it? Whereupon the foundations thereof fastened, and who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Sons of God thereby are is a term for angels in the Old Testament. In other words, the morning stars and the, and, and, the, and the sons of God are cheering when the creation was done. So they were created earlier. They were created, but even before all this. So the issue really becomes, what about Satan and his origin and agenda and, and his destiny? We've already talked about that somewhat in our study back in Isaiah 14. Uh, probably the most revealing thing here is Ezekiel 28, where again God is speaking to the king of Tyrus at first, but he's really, his, his, his rhetoric goes far beyond that. It goes into the power behind the throne, as you see there in verse 13. Thou, wast, thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. He's talking about Satan here. Every precious stone. And it's interesting the way he describes Eden. It isn't in terms of agricultural things. It's in terms of colors of light. Every precious stone was like covering the sardius, the topaz, the diamond, the pearl, the onyx. It goes through all these these uh, ways of expressing uh, light. And the workmanship of thy tablets and pipes was prepared the day that thou was created. Apparently he was a great singer. Satan was. Thou hast been in the Eden, the garden of God. And uh, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Strange, quaint wording there. The cherub is a super angel. The anointed one, that is the one that covereth is the one in charge. Satan was in charge of the other angels. And I have set thee so, and thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, and thou wast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in the days from thy, the day that thou wast created. He's a created being. 
until iniquity was found in thee. That's where sin began. In the heart of Satan. That the anointed cherub covereth and until iniquity was found in thee. Key passage. We won't take more time of it here. By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence. Thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. And all they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. How art, and then now the Isaiah passage, which is parallel to that, we studied back in Isaiah 14, but just to refresh your memory. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will sin in heaven. I will exalt my throne upon the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend upon the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. The famous five I wills. That was his ambition. God says, Thou shalt be brought down to Hades, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble and did shake the kingdoms? That made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof? Then open not the house of his prisoners. See, here's an allusion to something we don't know much about. When did he make the world a wilderness? Well, just in terms of our current history of wars, maybe. And destroyed the cities thereof, and opened not the house of his prisoners. What's that talking about? We don't know. Some scholars suspect that this may refer to events that occurred prior to the second verse of Genesis. And it was all judged and destroyed, and that's what the earth had become without form and void. And millions of years may have gone by, and Satan unable to repair any of that, until the Spirit of God brooded above the waters and received the creation occur that we have recorded in verse 2 and following. The earth became without form and void, and darkness upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved or brooded on the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light, and then it goes on from there. And so we could go through and all of that. But is, is what we are familiar with in Genesis, what we might label as a recreation following a judgment? Eons may have continued without Satan able to replace what was once his, was once his domain until the Spirit of God moved over the expanse and we see the creation as we know it take place. That's, that's, the, that's the thing that uh, Donald, uh, Donald Gray Barnhouse's uh, book so skillfully fit. And we have a whole briefing on the origin of evil if you want to get into that and so forth. So, Well, anyway, we spent the whole time really on Isaiah 45 because Cyrus deserves the focus. It's, so, it's critical both for history but also because of our future to really understand because that background will be fundamental in understanding what really is going to happen to Babylon. But then also I, I didn't want to, to uh, not deal with the, the gap theory. I'm among those that I don't want to oversell it, but I lean that way myself. I'm among those that you know, think that's, that's worth more study. I really do. But for your next session, I'll give you three chapters to study. They're not long ones. So 46, 47, 48, God is going to take after the idols and, and reassure Israel. And it's a, we're moving our way up to the climax, which is 53. So we're getting there. So with that, let's have a closing word of prayer, and we'll have some question and answer time.